Uh, I met Mark when I was an industrial designer coming from industrial design into computer graphics. Uh, I had been working at different design firms in the East Coast, doing everything from uh, detergent bottles for Colgate Palmolive to uh, private jet aircraft interiors to packaging for Kodak. And I was curious about why marker rendering hadn't gotten advanced to computer graphics. And so I started learning computer rendering. And then one day, uh, I worked in a bit of a madman environment one day, and the boss came in and fired a bunch of people. And he looks at me in the back. He goes, and you, with the computer graphics, you get out too. And with that, with that happening, I went and borrowed about $25,000 from my mother to buy a used Macintosh 2 FX that could draw, I think, eight colors and started learning this computer graphic stuff. And that's how I met Mark. And that's relevant because that's also when I started, the first time I straddled the line between product design and entertainment. And a few years later, I wound up in entertainment at Electronic Arts, uh, setting up the motion capture labs about which I knew nothing about. Uh, but if you've seen motion capture, you know what it is. If you haven't, it's when you see somebody with a bunch of ping pong balls doing things that a ca computer captures and puts into your favorite film, video game, movies, webisode. And so I did video games for a couple of years and I started getting into creative development and creative direction at EA. And uh, at the end, I was leading the creative development and visual development for Worldwide Studios and how we, how we approach things and how we approach design process. And then when it was time to come back to the US, I decided to stay in Europe. I was in Europe at that point. And then I went back into entertainment. And I went into feature feature film visual effects production, and then I started building a helped to build a feature animation studio in Europe, the first three D animation studio in Europe. And then after that, what happened? I went up uh, coming to Microsoft to work in the Xbox group for a few years, and that's important because when Xbox when I was done with the Xbox project, I got asked to come be the creative director for Surface, the first Microsoft Surface, uh, which we used to intimately know as the big ass table. And uh, before there was the, the tablet, there was the table. And what the reason they wanted me was because I had worked in product design and entertainment. And it was the first time anybody ever said, we want both those skills. Then after service, I started surface, I started working with an applied research group. And that's when I stumbled into healthcare. And somewhere between surface and the work in healthcare, I got really intrigued in how we use what we learned from entertainment to keep people engaged, to how we keep people engaged with their own healthcare and how we take uh, maybe something like an addiction loop of how we design video games to keep people addicted to a game and how do we turn that into an adherence loop by literally mirroring it. And so I started playing with these ideas with some folks at USC after I left Microsoft and the Institute for Creative Technology. And that led me deeper and deeper to healthcare. And ever since I haven't gone back, I've, I've done the occasional entertainment project in the last five or 10 years. But uh, as maybe I'm getting older or we get older or the fact that healthcare is 20% of our GDP, and we are not number one, even though we're number one in spend, we're not number one in outcomes. I really was fascinated by a space that A, was thirsty to have people with different mindsets and different approaches, and B, take this life learning I have. So it was around there that I started playing with this notion of emotional currencies. And what are the emotions that motivate us to do things in our daily lives? What are the intrinsic motivators as opposed to the extrinsic motivators? Um, this isn't about getting badges and gamification. And I say gamification with complete derision. This is about what are the things that motivate people that we can then help, how we take that and turn the design currencies and link them into the way we do design work. And so a few years ago, I was working with Anthem through my own studio. Uh, at the time it was Anthem Healthcare. They just started an artificial intelligence group and they were having some of the same problems that other people in healthcare run of, there was this great ability to bring big data in this fantastic group I was asked to consult with they were making great products, but I think even when they were making these first products of how do we power the, how do we harness this massive data we have of 45 million lives to help people live, be healthier and be healthier lives, achieve more happiness. How do we get that information in a way that is usable and meaningful? And it was that moment that I sat down and I realized that so much of what we hear about AI and machine learning is what the technology can do, what engineers or scientists think it can do, as opposed to what do people want it to do or need it to do, or how does it positively influence their lives in ways that are meaningful and improve their health outcomes and improve their quality of life. And so that's the long story of how I got here, Mark. As you're recalling that, that the storied career, which I dipped in many times to that, you, you remind me of this very interesting paradox, which is the designer v engineer, right? Yeah. It's the yep. it's it's the creative versus the analytical. It's the left brain versus the right brain. It's it's the it's the battle. Well, many well, of us well fight. what I was 
Right. What I would say is, you know, the engineer's view of the world, for good reason, is A squared plus B squared equals C squared. What's the most efficient way of the world? And I think a good product designer's world is, well, what's so interesting about A in the first place? And why do you even care about B? Right. Right. What, 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 what is it about B that is here right. that we want to participate? Right. right. And right. so so when you think, and what I what I appreciate about designers, and we've had a few on the show to talk about your ability to look at a big problem the word systems was was in what you talk about so it's how do i look at this thing architects do it designers do it anybody who has to create something out of nothing your bias is to come from it from the what what's the problem i'm solving but there's a, a word in here that i'm particularly interested in which is the word emotion mm -hmm. and i don't think we think that's how you approach the problem and just unpack that sure, a little sure. bit more because i think that's a big deal so so I, I i know there are some of my fellow designers that do work in, in the emotional space but i don't know there are many that lead with it and so what i'm thinking about is it started i, I started seeing it really clearly on surface that with all of the money of microsoft corporation and trust me we spent an awful lot of money on that product uh, i can't change your behavior no matter how much I have money I have, and trust me, I felt like I work for the company they we printed it. Money doesn't change people's behavior. People, it, it, it's a motivator, but money's not going to change behavior in most cases. If it did, all these incentives out there in the world would be changing people's behavior, and they rarely do. But then I started thinking about why do people accept things and reject things? And then I started working on, on a adolescent psychology project with uh, my business partner, Isabella Granick. And Isabella taught me that shame is one of the most dangerous emotions in the world. Mm -hmm. And she says, if you look at all the really bad things that go on, it starts with shame. And that was when I really started seeing the opposite side of it. So then I started seeing that you have these negative currencies and these positive currencies. Okay. And, and we do it in game, in game designers do this all the time in these positive, in these, in these reward ecosystems, in these economies of games. And I started thinking about what if we actually start really thinking about emotions as economies? Hmm. And can we use emotions to basically become design media so just the way I would use light, color, form, space, typography, time to tell stories or to make a visual language, a visual language to tell us a point, how do I use trust? How do mm. I use agency, giving you empowerment? How do I use empowerment? How do I use your context of who you are as an individual? How do I use those things and that recognition of you as design media, just like I use color and time and space? And then how so, do I so use... Me, let me, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm please, please, poke. please. So you're suggesting that there's a visual component to an emotion because you're using it like paint and this and this. I, so, I, think, I think in Western culture, there certainly is. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting it's not an Eastern culture. I just don't pretend to have studied Eastern culture the level I study Western product and art and design. But I think, you know, uh, you've like, in the, I think if you look at film, that's his, the, and our, our history of arts going back to caveman that we use visual to communicate it's evocative, use visual right. to communicate is right we use visual to stimulate we use visual to to sometimes suppress or to raise um and so i think that's again because we are visual animals right i mean our brains are designed to do threat detection for the minute you're born right right and and friend detection and so i think we're visual animals i think visual storytelling is how we sell so many products and how we're raised in this world so I think I think there's a clear correlation. Yes. So you're now a, a putting your big brain on this in your team, right? On like wh how can we improve healthcare? And and I have a sense you're 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 looking at this systematically, very big, yep. as you said, access to you know 45 million um, of records. Um, in thinking about that, it. I think we all have a sense of where healthcare is broken. And I'm curious um, because there's so much, if we think about Web3 and we think about apps, we think about all these new things. Yet when I go into the doctor's office, she's still going to hit me on the knee with that, with that hammer to see how my reflexes or, or the facts, are. Or the fact that there's still fax machines in doctor's offices. Right. So, so how... So it, it feels like there's a collision here. Worlds are colliding. Uh, and I'm curious, 
because you and I have both been worlds collided when computer animation came in worlds That's collided right. when, right. you know, uh, these various things. So it feels like you're, are, are we, how far along are we on that wave? Do you think? I think a couple things. I think the first thing is going back to your first point in systems design. One of the things I identified, and I'm sure other people have done it. I just, I'm amazed at how many times I show this to people that they, this is something new mm -hmm. is that too often we design something in healthcare for everybody, but the patient. Ironically. Okay. So, so the electronic medical record, which is now the real lifeblood of modern digital healthcare, the, you know, the modern healthcare in, in America, um, the problem is it was never designed for physicians or patients. We're just mere artifacts in the ends. It was designed on how to get people paid. And if you think about that, the most system that we're so dependent on now is the EMR, the electronic medical record, was never designed for what it's used for. Hmm. So just, just ponder that and ponder the fact that there are multiple systems that are supposed to talk to each other now, but don't really talk to each other that well. Ponder the fact that there's not even time stamping within things because a doctor may do something now and he may not get to that until nine hours later. So we have this, we've become dependent on the technology that was never even designed for the patient hmm. care, for the patient's care, I should say. Right, 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 right. And so if you think about that, you can think about, I think you can look in multiple places across the healthcare spectrum where the patient, it may have been designed for the patient, then it may not have been designed for the physician or designed for the physician and it wasn't designed for the patient. So I'll give you my other favorite example is that, um, I believe that the primary care system was designed by Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah. Because I think about it, in any Hitchcock movie, you never see the horrible thing happen. It happens off screen. That's why, there's the, that's why he's the, the, still the best there at horror. You go to a doctor's office and what happens? You come in and you walk in and the first thing they ask for is, do you have money? Okay, you're right. Okay. You're right. Yep. You don't go into a restaurant and they say, do you miss your wallet? You don't go to the car deal, they, they, they make their assessment, right? Nowhere else do they say money first, but we're here for you. And then, then this woman hands you a clipboard, it's, right? She may or may not make eye contact with, and they say, sit down and fill that out. And you go sit down in these chairs that you don't really feel the cleanest in the world because the people next to you are coughing and they've got things happening that may or not be appetizing visually to use, go back to the visual point. And you fill out this form. And you come back and you hand it to this woman and she says, oh, you didn't do this right. You didn't do that. You didn't fill it out and sign here. So now you've been shamed again and you hand it to her and she says, okay, sit down. They'll be with you shortly. And you go and you sit down in that icky seat by the kid coughing on you and you pick up the magazine that's nine years old and could in God knows what bacteria. And then the door opens and somebody opens the door and pronounces your name wrong. And then you come in and they make this nice small talk. And as you walk up this hallway, you hear very interesting sounds. Sometimes they're not good human sounds. Sometimes they're machine sounds. And they put you in a room and tell you to take off some of your clothes and sit on this piece of paper and wait. And they close the door with you and your thoughts in a room with things like the word sharp, dangerous, acid, razor blades, life-saving mm -hmm. scalpel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they just let you there with you and your thoughts. And that, I mean, Hitchcock couldn't even do that better. Then you start hearing these sounds outside the door. Is it my turn yet? No, it's not your turn yet. Is it my turn yet? No, it's not your turn. Then the term is like, that's just coming, coming back in there. I want, they want to, what's, what's your name and birth date? What are you saying? You don't know who I am? You don't know why I'm here? Well, they're actually doing it to protect you, but there's no, right? And then what do they do? Then they sit down at a computer and start typing to the computer while they can't, they can't maintain eye contact with you. Do you get to see what they're typing in? No. Okay, great. The doc will be with you. Then they get up and they leave. And now you're sitting half naked on this piece of paper, waiting, again, along with your thoughts. And then the doctor comes in late and the poor doctor has probably 1,500 to 2,000 patients. So how do they remember who you are on the other side of that door? So they've got to cram up on you and remember who you are. And they come in, they really only have at this point eight minutes to see you. And they're trying to be congenial with you. And then they got to go to the computer and not make eye contact. And that's my point is that you couldn't design a system less friendly for the most intimate discussions of your life. Mm. Right. So you've clearly identified the problem very visually. Um, you know, I you can, I can see, and we can all who are listening can see this. We have a few minutes where I'd, I'd love to hear, give, paint a picture of the new reality for me. For so us. so the, the place that we'd like to take you, is that how much of that work you just did with the clipboard is done at home on your leisure? 
how much of the money thing is taken care of before you even you could worry about it? Because the, 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 we, it's just the American system that's not going to change. But how much of that is the data updates automatically ups, uh, uh, clearly in advance? And you know that this business is going to cost me $20, but if I go into something else, it might cost me 50 but at least you know what to expect. So you're ready for it. And you know what your plan is going to cover and you know what your health savings is going to cover. But more importantly, how much is done in advance? How much of it's that, okay, so you're here for your annual checkup. So what we did was we actually sent you to the lab first to get your blood drawn first. Right. So when the doctor comes in, he had time to read it in front of him or her and then make eye contact with you and have a conversation with you because she's had the time to do the work. So how much information then can my team do to get it to the doctor in the right format in the way that they can most reasonably process it and have time to do their homework and their curiosities. And then how much of my team can we then say, so if we use me, I'm a 57 year old male, a little bit overweight, I've got mild arthritis issues. How many other 57 year old male are just like me? And what are they, what's going on with them? What do they do differently than me? What works better for them? What doesn't work better? So the doctor can have a conversation with me that he's empowered and I'm empowered. And we're in front of it, as opposed to, we're both coming in on our heels. We both haven't had time to think about what's important to us for that day. And what's important about this visit. And we both haven't had time to really have a conversation about what the options are in an informed space. And then when I go home, have that information to take with me in a way that I can process. So if I'm a video learner, then there's videos for me to take about it. If I'm somebody who really likes podcasts, there's a podcast version of it. If I'm a reader, then have me the PDF. But what, what's the right way for me to process that information as an individual? Because the system knows me, the doctor knows me, and he knows the things I tend to do and not do. And he knows the therapies that are going to be much more likely for me. Right. So in this this new reality, because I'm thinking of I, I'm very fortunate. Santa Barbara has amazing health care and I do the electronic check in. I do all, like all of that stuff. I go in and, and from the very first minute, she is right. Very present with me. Yep. And, and I feel like I'm I'm very lucky as a result of that. And that's not generally that's not widely distributed that that sense. Um, are are we five years away from you know reform that you're talking about, where no, where we have know. data driven? That's a really, that's a really good question. So what's interesting now is what. So when I signed on this project two years ago. We kind of had a pretty good idea of the data, and the data was out there. And then what we started seeing was we weren't getting the data in a in in, the, in a way that the physicians could use it. Uh. There you go. And so then, that's, right. that's so that so it living in this world of big data, it's how do I put it in a way that I can easily digest it because I'm really busy either as a patient that's right. and I'm reading that's my right. reports or as a doctor uh, and I'm trying to serve my patients. Evan, thank you for helping me explain all of this. This this a big topic. Yep. Yep.